Hi, this is Bruce Rawls. I'm speaking again with Dr. Bob Rosenthal, and we're uh, wrapping up for the part four of a four-part series in a conversation about his book, which is From Loving One to One Love. And uh, we thought we'd, we'd just pick up where we left off, basically. So anyway, um, welcome, Dr. Bob. We thought we'd just kind of be somewhat spontaneous and just see where, where this goes. But uh, there's so much in every part of your, your new book that uh, is wonderful. And um, for, at first, you, uh, do, would you like to make any announcements or updates? Um, first, uh, that I will be participating in the uh, conference, A New Beginning, over Memorial Day weekend in a couple weeks. That's May 23rd and May 24th. It's all virtual. Um, there's a huge lineup. I think there are like six keynote speakers, including uh, people like Neil Donald Walsh. So it's not completely A Course in Miracles conference, um, but it should be good keynote speakers and then smaller breakout sessions where hopefully we can get to a lot of question and answer and you know inter interaction with the participants. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking about the book. Just uh, to be clear for the audience, it's um, From Loving One to One Love with the subtitle Transforming Relationships Through A Course in Miracles. Because uh, otherwise you might not understand what that title means. But exactly. Transforming yes. Relationships, hopefully it becomes clear. It really does help to have that subtitle, doesn't it? Because yeah. Yeah, that, that's so much an emphasis of the course. And, and I like how you, you know, wrap up this book with you know, talking about all the 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 one to one and uh, uh, ultimately it's the the one to many and the one in many and the many in one <laughs> and because it's a pure non dual course and and that's really where it's all headed isn't it so yeah exactly yeah exactly. I mean I I, I I like to say that and and some people would disagree with this but I like to say that the course is working at us from both ends it speaks to us down here in the realm of separation and illusion where we believe that we are separate distinct bodies with different personalities and different life histories, um, while at the same time always holding for us the, the, the knowledge, truly the, the remembrance that, that we're all one, that we never left, that love is the only reality, that love created us like itself. And so as, as the obstacles to love's presence, the various aspects of separation that we invest in, as those become um, more and more removed and removable, and as we catch them sooner and sooner, the non-dual side starts shining through more and more, and we get those beautiful glimpses and experiences that, that let us know that that really is truth. Because otherwise, why the heck would we do it, you know? I mean, you know, the course would be, as you and I have talked about many times, it would be an insane teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything that's teaching that reality isn't real. Uh, but wait a minute, uh, as the Course says, the case for insanity is strong to the insane. So, you know, we're <laughs> insane. Therefore, what is sane looks like it's nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The ego's uh, insane thought system has everything inside out, upside down, and bass backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and as you're sharing that, I was thinking, you know, that it really is a, um, the forgiveness classroom of the course is a, you know, a progression through, you know, mental uh, recognition uh, over time that we, we can actually transform our identity from a, a, a personal identity to a transpersonal one. And, and uh, um, you know, that, that awareness gradually shifts and we, and we see that the, um, the, the suffering that we experience is really appendage to trying to make something that's in, inherently unworkable, unsustainable um, work. And that, you know, that's, you know, the course refers to special love hate relationships as being, you know, two sides of the same, you know, fraudulent um, fiat currency, basically <laughs> same, same bogus coin. And, uh, and, and that, uh, you know, where we're really headed is, is that uh, more all inclusive like agape, if you will, kind of a experience where, we recognize that you know everyone is is uh, the identity that uh, uh, you know probably most closely reflects the pure non-dual oneness that the course is aiming at. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, you go to Bob Marley, one love. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
exactly. let's get together and feel all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I like how in your book, you know, the, again, the progression of, you know, looking at, at all the, the, the barriers, which is what the course does uh, as, as well, um, of, you know, looking at the barriers to, the, you know, the, that mm -hmm. awareness of love's presence and using the, uh, the, the specific relationships and then, uh, you know, as, at some point we recognize that we can generalize and then go from from the specific to the general, and uh, and I think that's what I think that the last section before the uh, the last paragraph or chapter before the the last section in the book talks about intimacy, and 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 I, I think that's certainly a, an area that on some deep level we all crave an intimacy with with the Creator, but we, how that's verbalized or whatever is is uh, you know probably varies all over the map, but. But, you know, there's that longing to go home. Like, like, I think what comes to mind is, you know, work with Lesson 182, you know, I'll be still a moment to go home. And, and uh, in, in that, the, the poignant uh, prose about the, the child that just longs only to return and have just a, just a, a whiff of that air, so to speak, <laughs> you know, just, just a moment's calm and, and solace and stillness that, uh, you know, really kind of hints at the the embrace, if you will, of, of our creator that we're all wanting to return to. And uh, so anyway, I was, I was really, you know, uh, inspired by what you, what you shared in that. And, and, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, the intimacy, intimacy in the course's terms and, and how that leads to the, uh, that all, all encompassing. Uh, I mean, of, you know, the course, I'm pretty sure doesn't use the word intimacy per se, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but as a, um, you know, as someone who did a great deal of couples psychotherapy, the idea, the concept of intimacy was always um, very front and center, very near and dear to my heart. Sure. And, and in a way, it kind of wraps up so much of the rest of the book. Um, just as the last time we talked, or maybe it was the time before we were talking about reframes and the ability to take a particular situation that was associated with certain negative emotions and over the course of time enlarge our perspective so that what seemed huge at the time, you know, within a larger context just isn't that big a deal mm -hmm. and how the Holy Spirit's perspective was the ultimate reframe that when we look at everything with the help of the Holy Spirit, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, um, nothing in this world of form and illusion really uh, amounts to a hill of beans, uh, as, as they say. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, um, we strive for intimacy in our relationships. And I think we first conceptualize that in terms of specialness. You know, intimacy is if your specialness and my specialness happen to align really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and isn't that cool? Uh, so we must be very intimate. But as a working definition, as a psychotherapist, what I came to, and, and this isn't original to me, some of this is from the group uh, I mentioned uh, in, in the book, uh, Don Nathanson uh, in Philadelphia, and the little group of psychiatrists who helped influence me, uh -huh. that intimacy is really about transparency. It's, it's mm -hmm. about... Um, trusting that if you bring forth what is within you uh, to your intimate partner, that that person may not like it, but that they will welcome it simply because you are revealing and exposing and that they will do the same. And that this is the pathway by which we can overcome sort of the core shame of, of, of our lives. But at the deepest level, our core shame is about separation. You know, oh my gosh, look what happened. I, here I was, the son of God, and suddenly I'm in this little body that's limited in all these ways, and my memory doesn't work the way it should, and my body has its limitations. So that core shame, when we bring those things to the Holy Spirit for healing, rather than hiding them, and of course recognizing that our relationships are, as I like to say, the crucibles for enlightenment, that, that it's only in relationship that this stuff gets exposed. You know, you can go meditate on, in a cave for 30 years and nobody's going to call you on your stuff. Nobody's going to say, hey, Mr. Sadhu, you know, you, you smell bad. And then you have the shame reaction around that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's only in relationship really that, that these aspects of what we think of as our self-concept get brought to the surface with all the hurt and the anger and the shame. And yet we need to see that and reframe it as a gift because we, would we wouldn't spot it otherwise. You know, we'd think we were doing just fine and we're on that track to enlightenment. Why? Because we never challenge ourselves. We can't see our own blind spots. It takes family. It takes an intimate partner to do that. So the challenge of intimacy is allowing these things to come up. Um, and they can be your deepest, darkest, dirtiest secret that you never wanted anyone to know about. But more often, you know, it's, it's just the seemingly little stuff that irritates us so much. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when your partner, uh, when you, you make some comment about something going on in the news and your partner disagrees with you, uh, well, how dare they? Or rearranging the fridge or something like that. Yes, um, the, the areas <laughs> where I see this come up most often in therapy are arranging the dishwasher. It's amazing how many people one of them will load the dishes and the other rearrange it. <laughs> uh, that, that's very helpful to hear, Bob, because uh, I, I'm, I'm solidly in that camp. <laughs> I run into it all the time. Now, I don't do it, although she's a little better at it than I am. I admire her ability to take my creation in the dishwasher. And go, oh, well, let's move this here. And let's move that there. And it's all good. But I'm constantly rearranging my kids. So that's one. Um, driving is another. You know, everyone thinks that they know how to drive the best. Uh, and when their partner is driving, you know, no, no, don't do it that way. Right, um, right. Phone calls is another. I, I used to tell couples, look, whoever has a stake in the call should make it. And if you want the other person to make the call, don't stand by their side and tell them what they should say. If you know what should be said, you make the darn call. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's very obvious that you've been doing psychotherapy for a lot of years. <laughs> I, I think I think you're uh, you're doing the Jerry Seinfeld of uh, of of, uh, of of relationships here because uh, he he's his genius is you know spotting the obvious and sharing yeah. it in, a, in an amusing way and and you're it's doing the same here. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they do come up. That's, for sure, for sure. That's where we're challenged. I exactly, mean, exactly. I, and I love the I love the reframe idea too. I mean, when you when you shared that in your book, that kind of like light bulb moment for me. And I was thinking, you know, that first step of forgiveness really is is reframing our definition of self. Yes. To, so so that so that it's not about the other person as separate. It's like okay, that other that alleged other person is me, and and therefore. It's I, I the they're off the hook, and and that now it's okay. Now it's my mind that I have to work with, and I and I still need Holy Spirit for the next step, which is the the you know the seeing with that reframe that you know. Then I'm thinking like the Powers of Ten movie, you know. That, oh right, I remember that well. Yeah, yeah, where where the, the, the you see something someone lying on a on a blanket on a in a park or something. Should, right. Yeah, and then they keep zooming out and out and out, and pretty soon. You know, after a few powers of ten, you you see that they're you know in a, in a, a, a like a campus setting somewhere, and then you see it's like near Lake Michigan or something like that, and then pretty soon you see the whole all of Great Lakes, and then then the whole planet, and then then it backs up you know a few more powers of ten to the solar system, and and then the galaxies, and then multiple galaxies, and then pretty <laughs> pretty soon you you there's no way that little pinpoint of of little less self is going to you know be even a, a blip wannabe on the the radar and, exactly. and i think if we can do that, that that with the space and the time of our our individual what i call the sssss the silly seemingly separate self um <laughs> and remember yeah. to not take it so seriously then then you know we lighten up don't we i mean and, and that so that reframe is such a great word because it really encompasses both time and space but also importantly the the our concept of self which you yeah. know, Jesus talks I mean, about in that last chapter in the, the text, you know, it's like. And you know, self even with time, um, how much is any one little life in a body, uh, you know, what does that mean in the gr grand context of eternity? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and is there any measure of success other than how loving were your relationships? Um, how well mm -hmm. did you transcend the sense of separation and the, feelings of paranoia and attack that go with it right. um, in order to recognize in your brothers and sisters that's that quintessential sameness 
um, that you were talking about that we all share. Because really, you know, the ultimate reframe for a relationship is, um, yeah, we, we, there is no such thing as being alone. Either we go there together or not. Right. You know, in preparation for my um, webinar yesterday on, on true prayer, I reread the uh, prayer section of the Song of Prayer, mm -hmm. and it talks about, it gives us two little prayers, um, italicized, you know, one-liners that illustrate the diff different stages in, in the ladder of prayer. And one of them is we, we go, you know, we go together, you and I, uh, but that's not the, um, the final stage. The final stage is I can't go without you. Um, you know, one is a recognition of the togetherness, but the other is more the, um, you know, the, 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 and that's the only thing that works. Um, I was going to say the necessary and sufficient criteria, but I don't think it's, it's more, um, you know, one is the recognition, but the other is that that's, that you can't get there without uh, seeing your brother sinless. Exactly. Because if you're seeing him or her as sinful, then obviously you are carrying that for yourself as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it's workbook lesson, uh, what is it, 341, no, 341 or 351, you know, my sinless brother is my guide to peace, my sinful brother is my guide to pain, right. and which I choose to see, I will behold. Yep. And this idea is repeated over and over throughout the course. You know, every encounter is a holy encounter, but how we greet it is what we're going to get out of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always gets, you know, distilled down to that, that little binary switch in the mind between the two thought systems. It's either love or fear, the Holy Spirit or the ego. And, and uh, the decision makers can flip back and forth seemingly at enormous rapidity, but it's, it's always one or the other at any moment, isn't it? And, and, uh, and, and the challenge is to remember that we have, uh, as the course puts it, an appointed friend that, uh, uh, yeah, so something you, sh you shared a few moments ago was talking about, you know, the, the, the honesty and the, the, you know, the candidness of, uh, uh, you know, sharing what's in our mind. And I, I was, the other day, we were, uh, one of the study groups I'm in, we're talking about uh, you know, the, the phrase where Jesus says, we must be completely honest with each other. Yes. And then the, the, the humorous part, of course, is Jesus probably isn't withholding a lot from us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so guess guess where the onus is. You know? It kind of gets back to numero numero uno as we think of our separate self. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's intimacy, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Intimate with Jesus. Do you want to be intimate with the Holy Spirit? They are intimate with you. Exactly. You exactly. Not. Yeah. 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 So anyway, and that you know that is the prerequisite for making progress, isn't it? To 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 be willing to take all of our grievances and and all the stuff that we think is, like you were saying in in, in your book, went very eloquently, you know, the the guilt and the shame, you know, two sides of the same coin, and put yeah. all that stuff on the altar of the mind and say, okay, Holy Spirit, let's look at it together because you know together we have the light that will shine away the the, the silliness. Yeah, <laughs> that's what says, work yeah. that has to be done. I mean. You know, uh, I'm not a fan of it, but Bill Thetford originated the phrase, and I'm pretty sure Ken Wapnick used it quite a bit of bliss ninny. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, sort of a way of describing people who want to do an end run around their personal work. Right. And just go, well, I'm already in God. It's all one. It's all beautiful. Um, at, at the highest level, of course, that's completely true. Right. But if that was your experience, then what are you doing here exactly why would you need the course this remedial work right? yeah, you know? yeah 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 i mean you know you you would be ready for god to take that final step right right so i don't like the idea but but the course is always kind of this balancing act as i see it between doing the personal work to open the windows and doors to the light uh, of, and experience of oneness and love while at the same time not discounting that. So you'll find some people who are like, no, love doesn't exist here. There's not, you know, there's nothing in the illusion that's anything of God. Well, that's ridiculous because we're here and, and, and at our essence, we are of God mm -hmm. on the one hand. But on the other hand, yeah, uh, it's, it's, we don't see it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one of my more favorite lines, which uh, I used just yesterday in the webinar was, truth is not absent here, but it is obscure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. obscure we don't see it yeah looking through the glass darkly as yes. shakespeare said right <laughs>
Or was yeah. that, that was the Bible. Was that the Bible? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah through a glass I, darkly. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought maybe Shakespeare. Yeah, old, old Testament somewhere. Oh, um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, but so in that chapter on, um, you know, intimacy, the forgiveness challenge, the idea I was trying to get to is, you know, we all have heard these big forgiveness stories where, you know, we're, and I write about them in, in you know, loving one-to-one -one love too. And, and I think that they're very helpful, you know, where you hear how an ancient hatred became a present love. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they also sometimes have the potential to do us a disservice because we think, well, that's what forgiveness should look like. And that doesn't happen in my day-to-day -day life. But here's the thing, it, it can and it should, and it may not feel like, you know, the sky's opened and the light poured in. Mm -hmm. But every time you are able to take a conflict um, and remember that, uh, you know, that, that conflict uh, is, is inevitable in the ego's world and that conflict is the source of all evil, as the Course says, anytime you're able to take the conflict and own it as your own minds, as you were saying, Bruce, and give it to the Holy Spirit, even if it's like, oh, look how they loaded the dishwasher, you are, you are um, playing your part in the atonement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I coined the term micro grievances. Uh, <laughs> I, lo I love that term. That's great. That's thank a... <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of fond of it myself, you know, <laughs> playing off of the sociology microaggressions, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, which yeah. I like micro grievances better. Uh, the aggressions, we feel like they're coming at us and we become victims. Um, the grievances, no, those are ours. Uh, you know, to quote Shakespeare, this thing of darkness I own as you know mine from uh, the tempest. Um, so, you know, if we spot the micro grievances, and they're as I say in the book, they're they're everywhere. You cannot go through a day without little micro grievances and the judgments that they're based on, because your ego really does believe that. It alone is the sole arbiter of what's right, what's good, how things should be done, and anyone who disagrees with it really deserves the firing squad. We don't experience it that way because we don't allow ourselves to. Right. Exactly. But if you're really getting in there, it's like, oh, you idiot, how could you, you know, blah, 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 blah. Those are all incredible opportunities for forgiveness and your live in partner, your uh, children, your parents are the ones who are going to bring that to you in spades. And, and eventually your co-workers in, in an office when, when that uh, uh, situation may, may or may not be restored anytime soon. <laughs> hey, listen, they don't be in an office. I, can, I, I see it on Zoom. Uh, exactly, exactly. Generate and, uh, yeah. I, I was thinking on, on the micro grievances, you know, the ego... Uh, does not want to admit that uh, you know it's it's basically that that whole principle of projections like no it's it's not my fault you know uh, it's it's everyone else's uh, you know gig that is doing this to me and uh, so I was thinking you know if if we really honest and really examined the ego mind with with you know great accuracy instead of just a, a few little bullet points in the the ego's micro grievance list if, if we really could track the microscopic detail at which the ego is annoyed and perturbed by all the little minutiae and details in the world. It would be, it would fill up the, the first page probably within a few microseconds and then <laughs> spill out on the, and, you know, the, the, the unfurling scroll that would then wrap around the, the earth three or four times in a typical day, probably, right? <laughs> That's just one person, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Something like that, maybe. I mean, multiply that by seven billion. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, really. I don't know. It starts getting to be a real mess real fast. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, it's that awareness of noticing the grievances and catching them more and more frequently yes. and, uh, and, and just saying, oh, yeah, I could see peace instead of this. And I'm not upset for the reason I think, wow, what a, what a concept. I could actually do this yeah. more often. Yeah. And ultimately, and, and this might be a, a tough thing to get to, ultimately welcoming them because each one yeah. is giving yeah. you an opportunity Yes. to unwind some aspect of ego that maybe you hadn't seen in quite that way before. Exactly. I mean, one of the things that I've been working on lately is, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, 
I've been accused of having a sense of humor and I like my sense of humor, but sometimes I'll notice it wants to go a little bit dark or a little bit critical. And it might be very, very clever, but I'll, I'll sort of build in this little pause point of, does that really need to be said? And very often the answer is, no, it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I don't need to show off my, my ego's cleverness at the expense of what might hurt someone else. Um, even though maybe they'll laugh, maybe it'll be fine. So these are kind of the little, um, you know, sort of mental subroutines that we want to uh, become aware of. Uh, facial expressions, mm -hmm. uh, voice structure, you know, um, are you raising your voice when you're not aware of it? Um, I, you know, do you look, I, I, I was noticing on a, a large conference call that I was on that, that someone who I respect and like very much had sort of a chronic facial expression that was just the very mildest form of a sneer. Now, in, in, in the psychological school that I came from, the sneer is, you know, the upper lip goes up and it's, it's a facial representation of, I, I don't like the way you smell. We call it dismell. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is the basis of all prejudice and a great deal of judgment. You know, mm -hmm. people from one culture always think people from another culture smell bad. Um, and, and so it's just gee, that, it would be great for, for that person to be aware of that so they could work on it. Now, I didn't know them well enough that I felt comfortable saying, hey, you know, by the way, you might want to be aware. But, but um, I think this is the kind of seemingly small thing that, that, you know, remember, none of them are small, none of them are big. Um, each one in its own way is an obstacle to the awareness of love's presence. Right. All, all those little micro grievances on that unfurling scroll, you know, can take a lot of different forms, can't they? And, and uh, you know, just, just noticing them and not condemning yourself when that scroll keeps <laughs> getting filled up and filled up and filled up. And, and eventually, though, you know, we'll stop at investing our identity in all those things and, exactly. and, and dismiss them. And, and they'll, yeah. they'll go in the recycle bin much more quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, what do we expect from an ego? Right. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's going to be nasty. I mean, what's the line? You know, it's suspicious at best and vicious at its worst. You know, if, right. if you haven't right. exposed it, then it's just suspicious. But, but when you really bring in your ego up into the light, now it gets vicious. You know, now it's going to go after you with everything it's got. And then we get blindsided when we're not, paying attention right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i, I was thinking then the, the scroll metaphor again i was thinking well you know what what uh, the holy spirit does sort of metaphorically is instead of uh, the ego will say oh each one of those little micro grievances is is now a you know a, an attack agenda item you know for, to be brought up again you know and at a future date or or acted on immediately um but the holy spirit just says he just keeps drawing red lines through them and, and puts them in the recycle bin. No, nope. didn't, didn't have any impact on our real being. <laughs> that real, that the everyone identity that it's working us gently and but inexorably toward. It says, you know, that that doesn't fit with your new identity that that I'm revealing to you that you never left. <laughs> yeah, we like could that, just yeah. see it as instead of this long, long scroll list of grievances that the Holy Spirit lets it all roll up real, 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 real tight. And then you can't read what's even on it. It's just this little tube. And, and from there, the Holy Spirit, you know, dissolves it completely. Um, that kind of reminds me of Helen's cave vision with the, yeah. the, the uh, you know, and, yeah. and, and wasn't the, the conclusion that, that, you know, Jesus commentary is like, Hey, you did good. You didn't try to, you know, you know, mess with the past or the future and, and you just, just let the, the God is in the middle be the, exactly be the focal point yeah there's something like ah you know you got it this time something yeah yeah to that effect. i thought that was a really neat oh story. i i i wept when i read yeah. that the first time yeah yeah, yeah. um because the past the future they, they you know it feels like they're so powerful and wouldn't you love to know the future um it doesn't exist you know it, you would be making it up as as you know it um you know, it's funny, I had a, uh, in terms of scrolls, I once had a, a, a psychotherapy mentor, um, uh, 
a very unconventional guy who, who learned most of what he knew uh, in the trenches um, on his own. But uh, like you and me, Bruce, he was a real fan of wordplay. Uh -huh. And he, and I don't even know whether this is true or not, but I, I, I enjoy the idea. He, he said the word control, which is clearly one of the ego's ultimate goals. It wants to control other people. It wants to control the future. Uh, it wants to rewrite the narrative for the past, uh, which we're seeing happening now uh, in certain political corners of the United States. But he said the word control comes from um, like uh, Roman times where the uh, patrician, the landowner, would have a role that would list all of the property you know, or all of the things that, you know, that he, because it was a he, um, owned. And he would compare that with what he could see, which so it was like contra role, you know, you're, you're comparing the role uh, with, okay. with what's contra to the role. And that's huh. how you knew who was stealing from you or who you, you know, needed to hang or kill. Um, and, the, and, and, and I haven't even thought of this before, but in mm. course terms, it makes sense because we're comparing someone with the role we think that they should be playing. And now wow. I'm running on that again. Yeah, that's a cool but, insight though. Yeah. But you know, we have this role. It's like, no, you are my husband, my wife, my child. Here's what I expect from you. Here are the things that you should be rendering unto me and you're not doing it. How dare you? you know, we're, <laughs> gonna, we're gonna punish you. We're gonna shame you. Mm. Um, and yet they're really doing you the favor of showing you where your own vulnerabilities and shame lie. For sure, for sure. Yeah, as you're saying that, it seemed like the, um, the one way to I find helpful to generalize that is is to to notice all the different ways that that could come up is, you know, attachments and aversions to outcomes, and it's just like you know as long as long as there's something in the world that happens or doesn't happen, you know we're you know comparing this mental list the the contra role <laughs> in our mind of of you know, here's here's what our ego says this i want it this way i want it thus <laughs> and, and and here's the alleged reality being fed back to us uh, recently i've been, been having fun with the uh, the wizard of oz metaphor and uh, uh, so and you know pulling back the curtain and it, it occurred to me that you know that the this the upset that uh you know is is the ego's uh, it's really the, the feedback loop that comes back to us from the world um, is really misinterpreted, distorted, and 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 just generally, you know, mess, messed up, messed with royally to to not reflect the actual data, even just from the the, the you know physical senses. But but you know the 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 uh, the, the curtain is kind of pulled uh, with the in the ego's system. And until, until our inner Toto, so to speak, <laughs> and, and interestingly enough, I, in, in doing a little talk about this the other day, I looked up um, Toto in Wikipedia, and in Toto is Latin for all encompassing. Yeah, that's right. And it's like, how cool is that? So, so it's that part of us that is aware of what is all encompassing, that pulls back the curtain, revealing uh, instead of just the upset as the feedback coming coming back to us, you know, the, the booming voice and the, I'm the great and powerful Oz that makes us tremble. knock, need, knock, need and tremble. And, and it's, and it's like, wait a minute, this is a setup. You know, we see the little guy behind the curtain and it's like, I was upset about this. And first of all, we, you know, realize it's not in the world, it's in my mind. And then we realize, well, I, I put it there. It was the setup. It was my projection that, you know, made this whole thing in the first place. And, 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 propagated this whole dream scenario <laughs> how silly is that anyway and that will never get us home you know remember exactly the quest is to get home and she's relying on this facsimile of power mm -hmm. um, that gets exposed by what looks like a little dog but is in toto uh uh you know uh exposed as he can't do it and you know what happens he goes up in a balloon and you know disappears and who knows where the wizard drifts to right. um but but she discovers that she had the power all along. And here's the really cool thing. So, and I, you know, the Wizard of Oz, it's really portraying, I mean, the dream state, but also a dissociative state because Dorothy thinks she's in Oz. Right. It's really home all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, Kansas isn't my idea of heaven. And for all of you <laughs> listening in Kansas, my humble apologies. <laughs> really? But for Dorothy, um, 
who, you know, clearly lost her parents. She's living with her aunt and uncle. She doesn't feel like she has a home. Mm -hmm. um, and her precious little dog is, you know, everything she loves is being whisked away by this nasty neighbor to be put to death. Uh, you know, and then the, the tornado swoops down and it's like, could it get any worse? But she needed to hit bottom in order to discover that she had the ability to be home and to love those around her rather than wishing for something that she was never going to get in the form she was wishing for it in. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it is, it's such a powerful story. Um, mm -hmm. For many, many years uh, as a course student, I, I would, the two things that would reliably make me weep were The Wizard of Oz, the ending, and um, The Ode to Joy from Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is just this you know, this, this incredible embrace of everyone in love and joy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there yeah. we are. Yeah. And, and that kind of kind of ties into that, that, that last, uh, um, you know, segment of your book too, because, because I think that's the, it, it really transcends the emotion, but it, it encompasses it as well. Um, that, ex that experience that, you know, we can't really put into words, but yet we know that that's what we're being drawn back to inexorably. And, and uh, you know, it's it's really the the mellows between the, as Ken Wapnick used to say, the the you know the, the music between the notes, um, or the silence between the notes, if you will, that that is really drawing us drawing us home, huh? So, mm, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, that's nice. I hadn't heard that. That's very nice. Yeah. I mean, what I was trying to get to in that 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 final section, again, it's sort of that idea of the course working us from two levels, and that. Um, if we had the experience of revelation, of awakening, then you would think from that oneness, that experience of oneness, you could dissolve duality and separation in an instant. And indeed, in the instant of revelation, it is dissolved. But, but there are very few people for whom it works that way. There are some. Mm -hmm. um, there are some. You know where their fear is just immediately gone, but for most of us, that sort of is like um, a glimpse of the end of the journey that allows us to say, "I am committed completely to the journey," mm -hmm. and then you have to do um, you know the detail work of all the stuff we've been talking about, recognizing the micro grievances, um, bringing them up to the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, one of the most powerful passages of the course. Um, and uh, I don't remember the section, I, you know, I think it's in chapter 13, pretty sure it's page 256 of the foundation edition, but where it says, you can love only as God loves. Love is of God, we don't define love. And God's love can't know differences, distinctions. Um, you know, this was a very tough one for me for a while, because, you know, it's kind of like, well, what about my children? You know, of course, I love them more than the uh, the random person that I pass walking down the street. But the course is saying no, that that's not true. You have a particular relationship with them. There mm -hmm. might be more work to do. Uh, they might bring you more lessons to learn, uh, your children. But love is love, and it doesn't differentiate. And if we are seeing with Christ's vision there is no difference and we love our child no more but also no less than the street person or the politician that that galls you or the saint who you aspire to become it, it's all it's all one love mm -hmm. and, and so this is how you know loving one becomes one love we we work it from the level of our individual one-on-one -on -one relationships because that's how we conceptualize it but at a certain point, it does kind of transmute those and, and love becomes love. It, it's no longer dependent on the person or the form of the relationship as you see it, because that's how ego views it. It's more, no, no, you know, it's, it's like water. It takes the shape of whatever vessel you pour it into, but it's still fundamentally water. You know, the love gets poured into these different vessels of relationship and form but it's just love. Uh, it's not about the form. That's and a great metaphor. What I was trying to convey. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really just one thing. And, and uh, we, we, 
the the, <laughs> the fragmented mind wants to make it special and make it separate and 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 you know latch on to the specifics in a way that that you know like likes to control I think, yeah. thinking that that, so that somehow will will preserve it and yet it's sort of like you know we get close enough to pounce on it and, and we pounce on empty air <laughs> <laughs> you know like you know like a, there there once we yeah yeah well and this is the great you know the great fallacy in romantic love oh you know he or she uh they're just uh, or they you know they're absolutely amazing um i love them i love them and then you know you get to know them a little better you move in with them you don't like the way they load the dishwasher uh you know, you don't like that they can't talk to you in the morning because they need their coffee or they don't stay up as late as you do or you like a different kind of movie. I mean, the, the differences start getting their little claws in mm -hmm. and suddenly you wonder how it was that you ever felt so loving about them. Well, you didn't. That's the clue. You made them <laughs> special. You're using them as a foil to, you know, put all that love out there on another person um, so that you could benefit vicariously, but it doesn't work. Exactly. The love is in here uh, and out there or, or you're not going to find it. Yeah. Yeah. As you were sharing that, I was thinking, you know, the ego's recruitment poster is sort of like this, you know, this tropical vacation paradise kind of thing. And, you know, all, all the, all the, uh, the, the glitz and glamor and so forth. And in these, you know, heavily Photoshopped, uh, you know, resorts kind of thing um, with, with all the, all the things that, you know, people, think are, are, are wonderful and and but the flip side of the poster once once you get it home is is the is the the special hate side which is which is this you know this desolate yeah. <laughs> wasteland and, and it's like well that's that's the that's the uh the, the part that we don't want to look at and and yet either either one neither one is real but but uh you know it the, the first the first appearance oftentimes is this this uh you know recruitment poster that never quite delivers and and it's only until we learn to generalize with Holy Spirit's help that, you know, we start to see, well, you know, maybe that, you know, this, this other continent or, or island or whatever, I think the same tactic was employed here, you know, that I fell for the umpteen other times. Kind of there's the key. I mean, yeah. how many times does uh, Lucy need to yank the football from Charlie Brown? I love that one. That, that is such a great, the great one. Yeah, yeah. And when that relationship comes along, um, yeah, you know, there's this, headiness there's this sense of compellingness oh they 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 think i'm special how amazing <laughs> no you want to you know there's your there's our drug it's 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 catnip for egos um, you know or, or as eddie murphy would say what can panub in all the wrong places right <laughs> 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 yeah but yeah. but that's what we do and as egos we just you know we think we think it's in the world and then we eventually it seemed like catch on it's like well it can be reflected here but that's that's not the cause that's that's it's really a, a byproduct of you know choosing a teacher of, of kindness and forgiveness yeah yeah well you know seek and do not find is the ego's uh, motto the ego's guiding principle that loves us to keep seeking but it's going to keep us from finding whatever we find uh, is going to ultimately be revealed as you know the 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 old man behind the curtain or the uh, the lover with the, the bad breath uh, or, you know, who throws his socks on the floor. Um, you know, the, the, it's always going to be something because the ego really doesn't want you to find love. You know, the ego wants us <clears throat> to idolize one and then go, well, OK, I was wrong. That didn't work out. But look at him, her, them. Uh, now I know. And then that one doesn't work out and on and on and on. And hopefully at some point you get to that place uh, that, you know, 12 step groups call hitting bottom mm -hmm. or the line from uh, the early, early section in the text, you know, tolerance for pain may be high, but it is not without limit. Eventually everyone begins to recognize however dimly there must be a better way. That's the turning point. We've got to, at some point you have to realize that you've been the dupe of this part of your mind that has convinced you that it knows how to make you happy and that it can't, and that in fact, you do not know what happiness looks like for you, but that there is that appointed friend, the Holy Spirit, who knows perfectly well what it is, and he'll lead you there to the extent that you'll let him. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, very often we go, nah, not interested. 
I, w- I want I want that I want I want what I want. I'm attached. You know, I don't want what I don't want. I'm averse. Well, you know, sometimes uh, you got to play the hand in order to see it doesn't work. Yeah, um, yeah, seems like that. Yeah, as as you're sharing a moment ago, I was thinking of uh, Gilda Radner as Roseanne, Rosanna Dana on Saturday Night Live years ago, and the phrase that stuck in, in my mind from one of her skits was, "It's all with something," you know, and 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 so I and actually in my second book I had begin a, a chapter uh, with with her quote juxtaposed with uh, Jean Bogart who uh, was helping Gary Renard with these wonderful podcasts years ago, and uh, and in his rebuttal to that would be somewhat akin to the Holy Spirit's assessment of, of uh, you know, the importance of, of uh, you know, the, the egos in, uh, well, misinterpretations of things. And, and, and his quote was in response to uh, Rosanna, Rosanna Dana's, it's always something, it was, it's always nothing. <laughs> always nothing, yeah. <laughs> I thought those two worked really well together to, to kind of, quick short you know short distillations of the two thought systems that that you know the ego always makes big deals about out every little thing and the holy spirit says no you can you can afford to let go of the nothing all the and even the countless nothings that are unfurling on that scroll of micro grievances uh, eventually and let them all go and then realize oh i've been gifted with everything all along ruby slippers or no <laughs> as we mix our metaphors right that's right that's yeah true. yeah yeah. yeah, I'm trying to think. I think there's a beautiful pun somewhere in the text about, you know, well, if you believe in nothing, you will find nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I found it. Yes. Gold, gold plated. It is. Gucci <laughs> nothing. Yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we, and we glamorize, don't we? I mean, all, all the things that we make such big deals out of until we maybe, maybe back to that power of 10 zoom, zooming out again. And, and, and it doesn't really take that many powers of 10 to, to see how, how insignificant. We, and actually, it seems like we can do that in our own lives by just noticing, um, you know, even going back, you know, certainly 10 or, or 20 or 30 years, but even just sometimes a week or two or a month or two, you know, we can say, well, that was a, a really big deal then, but it's not now. Frequently, right? I, I, I live through that. <laughs> no, frequently that happens. And yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes I think it's a really good idea to look back through your calendar or your checkbook uh, and just see, oh, yeah, I, was, uh, I had that expense or this was going on. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, here we are. It's, it's always the present moment and love is always available. There, there is nothing that the ego mind can do to attenuate or change either of those in, in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you're right. Um, you know, perspective, perspective helps uh, a great deal. And the things even a few months ago that, that were all in, seemed all encompassing and all consuming, you know, they shrink to, oh yeah, that. But the amazing thing is no matter how many miracles we receive, no matter how much um, the sun comes up every morning, inductive reasoning, we never get to that place of trusting. Well, yeah, you know, I, I do trust. Well, we, we trust that the sun will come up again, but we don't trust that we'll be taken care of. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife, Emmanuel, has been reading Absence from Felicity, uh, Ken Wapnick's biography of Helen. And she read me um, a little section the other day where Jesus was talking to Helen and he said, the, the reason you need to let me take care of all the insignificant parts of your life is because if you have to focus on them, you won't be able to do your real work. Now, in Helen's case, I believe that was bribing A Course in Miracles, but I think it was also learning the, the principles of A Course in Miracles. So, you know, we get into this place of, oh, well, you know, I could never ask Jesus to help me, um, you know, deal with whatever small situation is bugging you. But to Jesus, they're all equal. You know, they're, they're all equally unreal. There's no small, there's no large. Um, So why wouldn't he be willing to help us in order to clear the decks so we can do the only thing that is important here, which is play, you know, the sole function of the miracle worker is to accept atonement for himself. Mm -hmm. Um, If, if we're too busy staring at the checkbook, um, and worrying about all the minutiae, then 
we do get pretty distracted and we don't play the role that he wants us to play and that the Holy Spirit wants us to play. So I think we all could get a lot better at, you know, that first characteristic of God's teachers, trust from mm -hmm. section four of the manual, and allowing the Holy Spirit and Jesus to help us. You know, we need yeah. all the help we can get. Absolutely. <laughs> for Helen, you know, uh, yeah. and, and, and we shouldn't be in a position of judging someone else's thing. I mean, you know, my wife was also reading me how um, Helen had an eyelash uh, in her eye. And she said, don't worry, Jesus always takes them out for me. And sure enough, within, you know, 10 seconds, the eyelash just kind of fell out onto her cheek. And Ken made the judgment, well, that was silly. That wasn't a miracle. Well, for Helen, it was. Mm -hmm. And reading it, I thought, you bet that's a miracle. I mean, and, and Helen trusted it enough mm -hmm. to say, I don't have to worry about getting that eyelash out. It's just going to come out. Jesus does that for me. And it did. <laughs> I think that's rather remarkable. Sure, sure. And, and of course, the, if everything in The Course in Miracles is always and only about the mind, then it's, it's all there, right? right? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. It's not but, out there. Yeah, exactly. A, a few moments ago, you were talking about, you know, checkbooks and calendars. And I think that's a great exercise. Thank you for that. And, and I, I've actually done that uh, without really thinking in those terms, but that's sort of what I've been doing occasionally. I'll, I'll realize, oh, yeah, that wasn't a big deal. And it reminded me of, of a, a quote that I heard that, that it was, uh, from, I think was from Mark Twain, who says something like, uh, there's been a lot of tragedy in my life, and some of it actually happened. <laughs> and, the, and then, the, then the, the course's rebuttal to that would be, uh, there seems to have been a lot of tragedy in what seems to be my life, and none of it actually happened, probably. So, something like that, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, it's, it's, but like you say, it's, it's, it's the uh, you know, bringing everything, that uh, all the little minutia stuff to Jesus and, and Holy Spirit, whatever you know, label doesn't matter. It, it, that, that appointed friend, that uh, that guide we took with us into the dream, that, that helps us remember to forgive and to to not take you know dream stuff seriously, but but use everything uh, for the benefit of, of atonement and forgiveness, and uh, and you know, we're we're liberated, and then we're re returned to that place. It seems uh, where the, the one love um, uh, is becomes. Uh, you know, more attain, attainable, and in fact, we we know that we're, on some level that we're we're already there, and just <laughs> fill, filling in the gaps, huh? You know, the light leaches through into the yeah, dark. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. yeah. um, there's, there's a, like a, a Leonard Cohen song, you know, they're cracking everything that lets the light in. <laughs> we, we, yeah. That's yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. yeah, yeah, yeah. If there was something that you triggered a thought in me and. No, I don't remember it, so it couldn't have been important. <laughs> okay. Well, it might have been. It might have been, but <laughs> <laughs> how do we know? Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Okay. okay. It's going to um, bring up. Uh, it's so essential to remember there is no order of difficulty in yeah. miracles, yeah. and even though it's the first miracle principle, and it's probably you know one maybe the one thing that just about every student of a course in miracles remembers and knows, we really don't apply it. Um, you know, we really don't because we keep investing the outside world with this um, false sense of reality that it doesn't have. Mm -hmm. It's all the mind, you know, any aspect of a dream, you know, if you dream that, that you're being pursued by armies intent to kill you, or if you dream that, uh, that you're winning the lottery, um, either way, it's not true. Um, you know, so there is no order of difficulty in miracles. And then the corollary line from, I think it's the Temple of the Holy Spirit section in chapter 20, there is no order in relationships. Either they are or they are not. Um, and that's really pretty shocking because what it really is telling us is that pretty much everything we consider a relationship is not. It's a bargain made between two egos. When we give it to the Holy Spirit to repurpose into a holy relationship, now it starts making that transition towards a real relationship, which of course is just um, the stepping stone towards, towards healing the fractured sonship uh, and, 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 and reminding us of our, of, of our you know, unalterable oneness. 
Yeah. What I, you know, what I cite in the book as the Jewish doctrine of tikkun olam, which I've talked about and written about in many, many places. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even come upon that concept until well into my, um, you know, uh, probably late 40s, early 50s, hmm. as, and was, you know, very much in A Course in Miracles. And it was just stunning to me that here it is, you know, Judaism had this concept that, 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 that God in creating God's creations, you know, that somehow he was pouring the essence of his Godhood into his creation and it spilled and fractured. And each little fragment of the creation has the essence of oneness and love and God, but it doesn't know it. Um, mm -hmm. And that our job, it's sort of back to the soul function of the miracle worker. The only job we have is to help put those pieces together. And we do that piece by piece, you know, relationship by relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that each each little act of, of true forgiveness um, restores the unity that was never lost, except in a dream. And and uh, uh, yeah, that it's it's interesting that that uh, you know the, the the idea of a hologram comes to mind with the you know the shattering thing because if you take a, a glass plate that's got a hologram on it, you know the, the original holograms anyway, um, and you could drop it on the floor and it could shatter into hundreds or thousands of pieces. And each one of those little fragments has the entire three-dimensional image on it because it's basically a, a, an interference pattern. And all, the entire image basically is impressed on each little you know, part of the hologram. So you could actually keep breaking those fragments farther and farther. We get dimmer and dimmer because there's, you know, there's fewer photons you know, recreating the scene. But, but I think it, just in terms of the physics of that is kind of a neat metaphor that every, every single shard has the entire Yes. Thing. <laughs> the whole thing, yeah. It's a beautiful metaphor, and it's a very yeah. accurate one. And the only difference is that um, with a hologram, yes, the image gets degraded. With God, the image can't get degraded. Exactly. There's nothing to ever really alter it. We, we cannot change what God created us to be. Right. But I think there's at least one or two places in the course where it says, you know, you don't understand eternity. Um, you know, the part does contain the whole. The part is the whole. Uh -huh. You know, and that's that's the amazing beauty of it. Uh, yeah. That's the experience we want to get to. But thank you for that. That's it's uh, it's probably one of the most powerful metaphors for understanding how we can be separate and yet part of a and yet be a wholeness all at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the separation is just something that we're fixated on and and projecting. That we turn off the projector and the wholeness is still there. Huh? <laughs> right. Yeah. Got yeah. It. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm noticing we've we've spent a little over an hour already, or almost uh, ten minutes over an hour. Uh, is there anything else you want to want to share? I, I really enjoyed. It. We, we seem like we've covered a lot of ground, and and and, and uh, um, there's so much in your your wonderful book. Uh, uh, if anyone needs a recommendation, I yeah, recommend it very highly. Um, uh, from loving one to one love, transforming relationships through A Course in Miracles, right? So, anyway. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. So thank I, you. Anything else to add? I always enjoy our conversations. Um, Likewise. You know, they're, they're somewhat like the text of A Course in Miracles. They seem to go all over, and yet there is, they're, they're held together by a real unity. And um, I appreciate it because there's some interviewers who don't understand the course that well, and therefore, you know, you have to sometimes hold back or not get into certain areas with them. Whereas we can just play with it and, uh, and know that, yeah, that we're shining a light on so many, so many areas of the course. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Bruce. Oh, thank, thank you. And it's, it's always just a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> is. It's a lot of fun. It yeah. Is. Yeah. So anyway, uh, well, looking forward to it. you have as much fun as we did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 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 So anyway, I've been speaking with Dr. Bob Rosenthal and uh, I'll, I'll put links to your website and, uh, uh, and on, on ACIM blog when I post the video and uh, looking forward to the next conversation. So thanks thank again, Bob. So will I. Thank you.